from now on is going to be how is stability of a feedback system affected by changes in the controlling parameters, the KT, tau I, and tau D. So in the last lecture, we saw the root criterion. Let me just briefly review that, and then we will do a few examples to illustrate how it can be used, and then we'll move on to the next tool. So we're just going to develop a set of tools for analyzing the stability of a feedback control system. So what we saw was that there is a characteristic equation, which is for a feedback system given by oops, 1 plus uh, 1 plus g equals 0, which comes from the denominator of the effective transfer function between the input and uh, the output. So the, we saw the reason why it is the roots of that uh, denominator, because once you do the partial fraction, uh, each of those roots will give rise to e to the power in exponential term t. So we want the real part of that to be negative, but we don't want to be able to actually do the partial fractions or um, go to the time domain. We just want to look at with a very simple test whether uh, there are any roots that are on the right-hand side of the imaginary axis. So the root test is basically looking at a, a way to look at polynomial coefficients and do some very simple arithmetic calculations and determine how many roots are there on the right hand side. So the st uh, starting point, as we saw in the last lecture, is take a polynomial of nth degree. So it is going to have n plus 1 constants, coefficients, starting from a0 to a n. And arrange them in a particular way in a table and do some very simple arithmetic calculations. Okay, so you take these coefficients and organize them in two rows. Uh, I've highlighted here row one and two, row two. And alternate numbers A0, A2, A4, A6, A1, A3, A5, A7. Now, in some cases, you might have that there are only an odd number of coefficients for any even degree polynomial. The second degree polynomial, you'll have three coefficients. Then you will fill the remaining ones from the second row with zero. Okay? So follow this pattern, but if you are uh, short of uh, numbers to fill the entire second row, fill them with zero. And then uh, start the calculation for the third row onwards using the formula that I gave you, which is very simple. D1, for example, will be calculated by taking A1 and A2 minus a0 and A3 divided by A1. Follow the same pattern and you build the table. And there are three results. Actually, you compute the table after you determine the table. And this is a nice problem for a final exam because it's just hand calculation. There is really nothing um, involving MATLAB. Okay? So you can expect a question of this time. So once you fill this entire first row, you look for sign changes. So the number of sign changes indicates the number of roots on the right hand side of the complex plane, and that tells you whether the system is stable or not. So, one of the conditions for stability is that there should be no sign change. Okay? And even before that, we saw that the coefficients in the polynomial should all be positive. Only then we can apply the root test. Okay? And then when you calculate the C1, D1, E1, there should not be, there should not be any sign change. Okay? So, this is how we calculate these coefficients. And the first theorem says a necessary and sufficient condition for all the roots of the characteristic equation to have negative real parts is that there should be no sign change. Question. Yeah. 
that was a very yeah. Uh, th th this is basically to indicate that there's a dot 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 and so on. Eventually, you will stop when you have only one term. Okay. Yeah, this observation. Because if you calculate the subsequent ones, it will all be zero using that rule. Okay. Under certain conditions, it's possible that two numbers in a row become identically zero. When that happens, that indicates that there is a pair of purely imaginary rules. That is, a threshold of stability to instability. When that happens, then you are interested in finding out what are those rules. So the rule then is applying the, one of the theorems that take the numbers that are before that row and uh, put them into a quadratic polynomial and solve them. Okay. So this is theorem 13.3, uh, which simply says that if any row completely becomes zero, then that indicates that there is a pair of purely imaginary eigenvalues. So you take the numbers from the previous row, two, two numbers, and plug them. So C and D come from the previous row. Okay. And solve that for the two roots, the quadratic, and it will always give you uh, a pair of uh, imaginary roots. Okay. And uh, if some of the elements in the first column are negative, the number of roots, the real positive part is equal to the number of sign changes. Okay. The first thing is there should be no sign change if you want to save a system. If there is a sign change, the second theorem says that the number of roots on the right hand side is equal to the number of sign changes. The third one says if there is a uh, row of zero, then there is a pair of purely imaginary eigenvalues. And that's an important one because the third one is the one that's going to allow us to determine the stability boundary as we are tuning the parameters. So we're going to apply these to a set of examples. The first example is, this is just to illustrate how the uh, table is built. So I have a fourth degree polynomial, and there are five coefficients. Okay. So I kind of color coded them. So the first coefficient is here, and then the third one, and the fifth one. They go on the first row. Okay. Then the second one, and the fourth one. That goes on the second row. Because I have only an odd number of coefficients, I'm filling this with zero. Okay? The last one is zero. And then I apply that particular formula to calculate all the numbers. So B1, for example, will be calculated as product of 3 times 5, which is 15, minus 1 times 4, divided by 3, divided by that element. Okay? That gives me 11 over 3. So you just fill out all the others. For example, when you're calculating B2, you have to watch out. This is a mistake, common mistake that you can make in the exam. It is this number, 3 times 2. Okay, it's always the first set of numbers, and then the number set of numbers that are following the current column that you're calculating. Okay? So it is 3 times 2, which is 6, minus 1 times 0, divided by the same original number, 3. So remember that formula, and then uh, the pattern, and do the calculation okay, for the next column. And uh, B1, so from, from this point on, everything will be zero. Okay. So you notice that there is no sign change. So it's a very trivial problem. The system is stable. So any control system that has this polynomial as a characteristic root has all the eigenvalues on the left hand side. Trivial part. With the table system. So that's what it says. Ask, uh, you're asked to determine the stability, and the answer is there is no sign change. So it's stable. That's a fairly straightforward question, problem to do. Any questions on that? What interesting one would be, um, well, yeah, uh, I wanted to make this comment. This is how you would do before the days of MATLAB, but now you can say if you're comfortable with MATLAB, all that theorem told me is that the system is stable. It didn't tell me where the eigenvalues are located, where the roots are. And it is as easy, in fact, easier, because all you need to do in MATLAB is enter these coefficients of the polynomial, pass it to roots. Roots is a function that calculates the roots of any degree polynomial. As long as you pack that vector C 
all the coefficients from the polynomials that you are given. Okay? So, and if you do that, you will get these four rules. Okay? And you'll notice that they are all uh, have a negative real part. So, confirming that the system is stable. But they all have an imaginary part too. So, the response is going to be oscillatory. So one can argue that you don't really need um, the root test to determine stability these days. And in practice, when you're working in industry, I don't expect that you'll be using root tests to determine the stability. But where you can use is in the next type of problem. Okay. In this example, you are given uh, a particular block diagram. Here it is. Okay. With the feedback control, and there is a measurement uh, uh, dynamics as well as the process dynamics. The process dynamics is given by this and this is the measurement. Okay. And you are given all the time constants and you are asked to find what is the value of Kc for which this system will become unstable using the root test. Okay. So how would you do that? Think about it. Okay. We are given tau 1, tau 2, tau 3. Determine the values of Kc for which the system is stable. Okay? Uh, and for the value of Kc for which the system is on the threshold of stability, determine the roots of the characteristic equation. What is the frequency of population? That is a very important point. Later on, also, when we are doing experimentally, we will look at that threshold where the eigenvalues just become purely imaginary, that the roots are just crossing the uh, vertical axis. So how would I approach this problem using the root test? First, give the effective overall transfer function, and in that, leave Kc as a symbol, as a variable. Okay, and then construct your root table using that variable. Okay, once you've constructed the table, you can the Kc will appear in all these numbers in the table. You can ask, is there a value of Kc that will make one of the signs negative? That will be the place where you'll cross the stability boundary. That's the general idea. Is the general procedure clear? So, everybody? So, the first step is construct your characteristic equation, and it is 1 plus g equal to 0. Okay? Sometimes g is called an open loop transfer function in some, uh, some textbooks. But we have to interpret that very carefully, the meaning of the statement open loop transfer function. It is not the transfer function between the input and the output. The out, output here is C, the input is R. The transfer function between the input and output is what goes into the numerator. Okay? That is simply the product of G1 and G2. But here, G1, G2 times H is what goes in the denominator. So it's 1 plus G1, G2, H. So it is as if I am cutting this loop open here. Okay? And then if I send a signal through this and I'm watching what comes back. Okay? So I'm opening up the loop and I'm looking at for any input that I put at this point, the signal travels through this and returns back and I've opened it up. So I'm not feeding back. I'm not using it to control, but I'm just looking at what is coming back at this point. So sometimes this is called an open loop transfer function, it's the terminology used in MATLAB uh, description also. Okay. So, but it is the product of all the transfer functions in, in the loop, 1 plus g. So that is going to give you this, 1 plus kc divided by s plus 1.5, s plus 1, 0.33, s plus 1. These are the numbers that are given to you. The time constant is 1, 0.5, and 0.33. Okay. So that's the first step. Formulate the characteristic equation. The second step is simplify it and extract the polynomial from that. So when you simplify it, what you need to do is just multiply throughout by the denominator, separate it out, and leave Kc as a symbol. That's what I said earlier. Okay? So Kc appears as a symbol, as a variable, in that expression for 1 plus g. So leave it as it is and simplify, and you will find Kc appearing here. What are the coefficients of the polynomial now? 1, 6, 11, and then you have to treat this entire thing as 
the last coefficient. So one of the coefficients of the polynomial is going to depend on the controller parameter. We should be able to generalize this to proportional integral and derivative action as well. Okay? So what you will notice is when you go through this 1 plus g equal to 0, set it up, if your controller has kc tau i tau d, view them as symbols and extract your characteristic polynomial, the coefficients of the polynomial may depend on all the kc tau i tau d. In this particular example, it depends on kc. Okay? Now we will have a problem. Can I take this and pass it to roots in MATLAB? MATLAB will not be, the root function requires only numbers because it's a numerical processor. So now we have symbolic ones. So what else can you do if you're doing it by MATLAB? You can solve it analytically. MATLAB has another function called solve, which is a symbolic solution. I will illustrate that later on. Okay? But let's do it by hand, and we'll do it by MATLAB. So I'm doing it by hand, what I'm going to do is take the coefficient 1 that comes from here, okay, and then the coefficient 11, okay, and then in the next row I take the coefficient 6, okay, and the last coefficient has the symbol, 6 times 1 plus kc, leave it as it is. Even if this appears in any of the other coefficients, tau i or tau d, you should just leave it like that. And the recipe to apply and construct that root table is the same as before. Okay? So in calculating B1, I'm going to take 6 times 11, which is 66, I get here, minus 1 times 6 times 1 plus Kc, divided by 6. Okay? I'm applying the same rule, but treating it in terms of symbol. And then I simplify it. When I simplify it, I get this as 10 minus Kc. You apply the same rule to the next one because there are zeros there, it will be zero. Okay? And do it for C1. When you're doing it for C1, what do you have to do? You have to take B1 multiplied by 6 times 1 plus Kc minus 6 times 0 divided by 10 minus Kc. Okay? So that is why you will get C1 as 6 times 1 plus Kc. The same rule that we are applying to calculate. But the first column now depends on Kc. Answer the question. For what value of Kc will that be unstable? Kc is a tunable proportional constant which can take any value from 0 to infinity. It cannot be negative. 0 to infinity because it's a uh, negative feedback. So Kc itself is defined to be from 0, any number 0 to infinity. So what does it tell you about number 4, C1? It's always positive. Okay. Now you need to apply inequalities and uh, just logic to decide to answer this question. Well, what value of Kc does it become does it then become unstable? So for example, if K is, uh, so the last column we agree is always positive, right? But so Kc is positive. Okay. Now the B1 can become negative if Kc is greater than ten, right? So that is your stability boundary. If you keep on increasing Kc, wanting a faster response, for example, if you increase Kc beyond 10, then this becomes unstable. So the root test is, this is where the power of the root test is. It's able to tell you where the stability boundary is. Okay? Um, so when Kc equal to 10, what happens to row 3? 0 and 0. So the other theorem applies, the third theorem applies, and so you can, that means you are just crossing. When k is equal to 10, the eigenvalues are just crossing that uh, imaginary axis. So there's a pair of purely imaginary eigenvalues leading to sustained oscillation. That's a critical value for k c. Okay? Even later on, when we look at some empirical way of tuning the parameters, control parameters, experimentally you can use the same idea. Keep on cranking up your controller if you have an actual process. You see when the system begins to oscillate for the sustained oscillation. That would be the critical value because you're crossing with imaginary axis. So the answer to this particular problem is um, Kc must be less than 10. If it's greater than 10, it becomes unstable. How many roots are there? If it is greater than 10, the two sign changes, right? From positive to negative here, from negative to positive there. Plus, it's minus, it's minus, it's plus. If Kc is greater than 10. 
There are two positive rules for any value of k c greater than 10. Any question? Now, the next question is at k is equal to 10, what is the frequency of oscillation? So we apply the next theorem where we take c and d to be numbers from the previous row. Okay? So in this case, put kc equal to 10. From the previous row, the number is 6. And here, when k is equal to 10, it's 11 times 6, 66. Okay? So take these two numbers, 6 and 66. And that will always give you, because it is s squared equals some negative number, when you take this to the other side, you can write this as minus uh, 66 over 6, which is minus 11. When you take square root of that, it will give you some sum minus j. Those are related to the frequency to the two pipes uh, thrown in the back of the oscillation. Any questions on that? Am I going fast or slow? Or okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. C1 is found by taking B1 multiply it with the previous number, okay? So it's going to be 10 minus kc multiplied by 6 times 1 plus kc minus the 0 times this, okay? So there is no other number. Divided by this number 10 minus kc, okay? So the 10 minus kc will cancel out, leaving you with, okay? So it's, uh, basically it's, Stick to the formula and apply it, and uh, you know, don't make any algebraic errors, it will be okay. Now, if I'm doing this in MATLAB, what would I do? Okay. So, let me find up MATLAB. Solve question. Do you have a question? Okay. okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. The elements of the array above above the array where the numbers are zero. The size of case equals to ten. This makes this go zero, and that's because one is zero, right? So I need to go to the row above that and take the two numbers up there. So the first number is six. The second number after it, which is what k is equal to 10. Because this goes zero, only when k is equal to 10. So when I have to k is equal to 10, I get 9 and 6. So basically, the row above that takes the two numbers. Okay. So I, I need to do, I cannot use roots anymore because I have my characteristic polynomial represented symbolically with the variable from the controller uh, constant, okay? So what I need to do is I need to define symbolically and not use roots, but use solve. Solve solves it symbolically. So let's look at how the results appear. Sense SKC, then the function is S cubed plus 6 times s square plus 11 times s plus 6 times 1 plus k c. Okay. So I have defined symbolically the function. I need to solve for the roots of this function. Okay. So I'm going to call the roots of R O. All F or S. <coughs> and how, how many roots should I get? It's cubic, right? So I should get three roots. And there are three roots. You don't see the last one because it's somewhere on the right hand side. But it's all given symbolically. So that you will find the KC everywhere appearing in there. So you cannot ans answer the question either positive or negative until you substitute values for KC, or use inequalities to find out when, for what value of uh, KC, the real part alone will become negative. So what I've illustrated in the notes is just uh, do the substitution, okay? So set KC equal to 10, 
and then so RO is a variable where I store the three rows. The result from power is from O. So I'm substituting that expression from O or the simple case is there to substitute the value. It gives me the numerical value of the roots. And you find two roots is zero real part and then I have a and one negative. So that's a neutrally stable system. Okay. So, if you do it with 9, you get all negative real parts. Okay. If you do it with 11, you get a pair of unstable. Okay. So, the stability boundary is somewhere between 11 and 9, but in this particular case, it happens to be 10. Which is what we found out from the root test. Okay. Any questions on that? Okay. I have left a few other exercise problems for you to kind of uh, play with it. Because um, you can't expect one simple kind of question in the exam. So, Familiarize yourself with these two problems. Let's move on to the next topic, which is um, the root concept of a root locus. What is root locus, and how do we plot it, and what do we get out of it, and what are the tools in MATLAB that will allow us to use that? Okay. So once again, we are going to start with a simple feedback loop, with g1, g2 being the transfer function in the forward path, and h is the transfer function for the measurement. So we have, as we saw in the last class, the output related to a step change R or uh, a load, a disturbance. But both of them have the same denominator. So the stability is determined by the characteristic root of the denominator on plus G. But now what we are interested in is how does the characteristic root of this uh, polynomial change continuously as I change the values of kc or tau i or tau d, and how I can, how I can plot graphically. Okay? So that is the idea of a, a locus of roots. So that's where the name is derived from. Locus is basically a curve joining uh, a parameter. Okay? And there is a standard convention that we need to follow because MATLAB uh, toolbox, for example, follows the same way of rearranging. All you need to do in MATLAB, for example, is to define the open loop transfer function. And it will recast the problem in a particular way and give you a graph. But let's go, go through what the process is. So G1 is a simple proportional controller. G2 is a second order process, 1 over tau 1s plus 1, 1 over tau 2s plus 1. And the measurement is a first order process. So the open loop transfer function is simply the product of all in the loop. Okay? So here, I, you, you might have a tendency to confuse, okay? But, uh, so, in this context, when we are talking about open loop transfer function, we are talking as if the loop is cut open and all the transfer function, I'm just repeating this one more time so that you don't make this mistake in an exam, okay? So, I'm cutting this open and then taking the signal that passes through okay, and comes back, okay? And that is what I mean. So, it's the product of all the transfer function in the loop. And 1 plus g of that is equal to 0. That is your characteristic equation. So g is given as product of g1, g2, and h. Okay, so the roots depend on all the three parameters in a PID controller. If you have only a P controller, then it depends only on KC. Okay. So how do I generate a graph like that? So here it has a uh, transfer function, which is defined in terms of the symbol Kc, but numbers, tau 1, tau 2, and tau 3, will be numbers that are uh, substituted. You'll find, and uh, we are going to just introduce another terminology, uh, not to confuse, but it is used in the graph that MATLAB generates, so you should understand and interpret what it is. You can take this equation and rearrange it in the following form, as g equals k divided by 
S minus P1 times S minus P2 times S minus P3. It's a very simple rearrangement. All we are doing is we are dividing by tau 1, tau 2, tau 3, both numerator and denominator. I can always do that. Okay. And then I'm defining Kc divided by tau 1, tau 2, tau 3 as K. K is uh, controller uh, constant. Okay. Because tau 1, tau 2, 3 are known. These are time constants. Kc is the one that I'm tuning. So in an effectively I'm tuning K in this particular form. And P1, P2, P3 are called the poles. Poles are the open loop tensor function. The terminology that you should uh, remember. All we have done here is written this as I'm taking this tau 1, divide by tau 1, divide by tau 1. Okay, so the tau 1 here cancels and I get simply S. And I call this as minus P1. Okay, so the pole P1 is nothing but 1 minus 1 over tau 1. It's a known number. Poles are known numbers. These are not the roots of the characteristic equation. These will become the roots of the characteristic equation under one condition. And we will see what the condition is soon. Okay? But those are just called the poles. And poles are places where the tensor function becomes infinite. As we change S continuously, when S equal to P1, the tensor function becomes infinite. But those are all known values. P1, P2, P3 are known. They are just related to tau 1, tau 2, tau 3. Okay? And they are called the poles. Now, when you do that, and then plug it into the equation 1 plus g equals to 0, after this manipulation, that is k divided by s minus p1, s minus p2, s minus p3, and then there's a simplification, that is cross multiply, and write the characteristic polynomial in this form, that I've shown in this equation. When does the poles become the roots of the characteristic equation? When k is equal to 0. When k is equal to 0, then you have s minus p1 times s minus p2 times s minus p3 equal to 0. Okay? Then the poles of the open loop tensor function become the roots of the characteristic polynomial also. That is typically the starting point. So from that point, you can change k continuously and plus how do these poles change into roots for radiate values of kc. Am I making myself clear? Are you following me? I think at the end of the term, you're probably all very tired, right? <laughs> Me too, but we need to go through this. <laughs> okay, any questions you have so far? Am I going fast or going slow? <laughs> so, uh, a particular example, I'm just going to take P1 equals minus 1. Okay, that makes tau 1 equals 1. P2 equals 2. P3 equals minus 3. Okay? So, that is, if you are given tau 1, tau 2, tau 3, you can calculate p1, p2, p3. So you know the poles, which means you know the roots when k is equal to 0. And remember this relationship. k is equal to kc divided by tau 1, tau 2, tau 3. And tau 1, tau 2, tau 3 are no numbers. Okay? So at this stage, I give you this equation and say, plot me the root locus diagram. What should I do next? Here I have the characteristic equation, and that has k in it. k is kc divided by tau 1, tau 2, tau 3. And these are the coefficients of the polynomials, 1, 6, 11, and 6, 10, k. Okay. So what I need to do is, I need to change continuously the values of k from 0 to infinity, and for each value of k, I need to solve the polynomial for the roots. So I can build a loop around the roots function, for example. I can set up k equals 0 to 100 in steps of 0.1, and for each time solve the roots, accumulate the data, and then plot. Plot the real and the imaginary axis of the roots. Okay? So as a numerical example, let's say if kc equals 4.41, and I know tau 1, tau 2, tau 3. Yeah, question? That's right. The poles depend only on the time constant, so they are independent of the controller constant k. The poles are only dependent on the time constant tau 1, tau 2, and tau 3 of the process and the measurement. So if I give you, for example, if I give you this, uh, if 
So I give you this block diagram, okay, and then I give you the values for tau 1, tau 2, tau 3, okay. So this one is Kc. This one is 1 over tau 1 s plus 1 multiplied by tau 2 s plus 1. This is 1 over tau 3 s plus 1. This is how the problem description will be, okay. And I will give you that tau 1 is equal to minus 1, tau 2 equals minus 1 half, tau 3 equals minus 1 third, etc. I give you the set of numbers. That determines the poles. Okay. No, uh, well, there is a relationship between the poles and the time constant. Typically, in your problem, the time constant that will be known. In this particular example, I started off with saying I know the poles and I calculate the time constant. That may be the confusing factor. Okay. Here I said the relationship between the poles and the time constant is given by this equation. So if I give you the poles, you can calculate the time constant, or if I give you the time constant, you can calculate the pole using that equation. Typically, you will be given the time constant. You will know the time constant. So you need to calculate what the poles are. Pole is a concept that we introduce in this context only. Time constant comes from the description of the process itself. Okay? So typically, time constants will be the given, uh, given numbers, and you will calculate P1, P2, and P3. Okay? And once you know P1, P2, and P3, you know this particular polynomial with K as a parameter that's tunable, that's changeable. It's a knob setting in the controller, for example. Now our question is, as I put different values of k, what happens to these poles? What happens to the roots of this polynomial? When k equals to 0, poles are the roots. Okay? As I change k, the poles will be, the roots will be moving, shifting. So here is the polynomial with k as a constant. So the coefficients of the polynomials are 1, 6, 11, and 6 plus k. And they depend on k or kc. Remember, again, between k and kc, there is a unique relationship. And that is k is equal to kc divided by tau 1, tau 2, tau 3. Okay. So if I know kc, then I can calculate what k is. Plug in the value of k. So 6 plus 26.5, which is 32.5. Now I have a cubic polynomial. I can pass it to roots, and I get these two roots, these three roots. The root locus, what I will do is, I will plot the real part and the imaginary part of these roots. I'm not going to plot k at all. These roots depend on k. Okay? They depend on k. But what I'm plotting here is, for example, minus 5.1. The imaginary axis is 0. Okay? So I will locate minus 5.1 and mark it at the pole. One of the roots is there, okay? And then where would the other two be? Minus 0.45 plus or minus 2.5. You tell me, how would I plot that? On the left half, I look for minus 0.45, and then go up and down, looking for 2.5. So these three roots are located on my complex plane according to this. And in my mind, I need to keep track that these roots correspond to a k value of 26.5. Okay? So the root locus then says, okay, now it's not 26.5, it's 30. I go back. Uh, if k is 30, I plug in 30 plus 6, 36, resolve. And I once again get three roots. And I plot the location of those three roots. Okay? And so I need to build a table of these roots as I change the value of k. And that's what I'm going to do next. Okay? So the first column contains the value of k, which is equal to 6kc. So either k or kc. You choose that. And then fix the polynomial coefficient and solve using the roots. So when k is equal to 0, the poles are at minus 3, minus 2, minus 1. Okay? And then the next row in the table says, OK, I'm going to make k equals 0.23. k equals 0.23, I have a new set of roots. They have moved, as you can see, on the graph. 
and 0 0.39, 1.58 is quick arbitrarily set of numbers like that. Now, looking at this, if I ask you to tell me the stability bounding, or how will you do that? For what value of k is the system going? This particular system going to become unstable because I colored it. What happens at point three nine? What happens? At there's something funny happening at this. Correct. Somewhere has been 60 cents. Somewhere has been 60 cents. 100. Why? Because this eigenvalue is minus 0.45 layer class because it's just 60. So at 60, I could have said, right, because that's where there is no layer class. It's purely in there. So that stability boundary is at 60. Okay. This is the same problem that we did before. So, because we define it as uh, Kc divided by tau 1, tau 2, tau 3, 6 times Kc. Kc was 10, so K is 60. What happens at 0.39? If your Kc were below 0.39, how, what kind of response would you get? The eigenvalues provide us a lot of information, and that's why it is useful to do this root locus sample. Uh, That's what I'm expecting you to understand, okay? Because if you don't have any imaginary class, then the response would be monotonic. There is no oscillation. So if you have KC below 0.39, you will get a monotonic response. If it is greater than that, you will have an oscillatory response. Now we need to understand what this diagram tells us. This is called the root locus diagram. And there are, what it is is the plot of the roots in the complex plane. So on the x-axis we have the real part of the roots, and on the y-axis we have the imaginary part of the roots. Okay. The three starting points are typically marked for you. Okay. Uh, what is that? Minus one, minus two, minus three. Somewhere there. Okay. And Remember when I told you that we keep track of Kc in our mind, or K values in our mind. And in the graph right there, they are symbolically written like at this point K. Okay. At every point on the curve, the K will change. Okay. So that's what tells us how the values of the eigenvalues change as we change Kc. So what has happened here is, uh, if, once, once I do it in MATLAB, you will see, because it's actually color-coded. There are three roots, and the three roots go in this way. One root increases like this. How do I know that? I know that because when Kc is 0.23, I have a root. And as Kc increases, the root increases. Right? So the curve that I have is two other pure real roots, and these were, those were here, okay, at uh, minus 1 and minus 2. One moves this way, the other one moves this way. As you change Kc, it's important that you understand this. So if you don't understand, please ask me. I'll try to explain it again. Okay? So the three roots to begin with, and k equal to zero, and those are purely uh, real roots. So they're all on the x-axis. And as you uh, change Kc, one of them will go this way, the other one will go this way. So they become complex. At what point does it become complex? It's on the table. Somewhere here, point three nine. And then they uh, spread across. One goes towards the top, the other one goes towards the bottom. What is most important for us is the crossing point. When they cross this axis, what is the value of Kc? That is your stability point. That's where you get a periodic solution. Any questions on the graph? I'm going to do it in MATLAB. Do you want, or do you want yeah, the graph basically contains the three roots. This is for a cubic. Our effective transfer function, the characteristic equation is a cubic. So there are three roots. So this gives you the branches of those three roots as you change your control parameter. Control parameter itself is not plotted on any of the axes. The x-axis contains the real part of the root, 
the y axis contains the imaginary part of the room. Okay. But the parameters, uh, values are indicated on these curves. What is the value of Kc at different locations, particularly at critical locations? And the three loops move around as they change Kc. One root starts from here and moves this way. And another root starts here and moves up. Third root starts here, comes and merges at 0.39 when Kc is 0.39, and it moves down. This will become clear when I do it in MATLAB because you will see the thing color coded. So let me start the MATLAB session. Okay. How do I do it in MATLAB? I need to define the transfer function. This is a, no. When we did it by hand, we looked at the characteristic equation, which is this equation that you see here. And we changed Kc and solved for rho. So we generated our own tables and plotted them. Okay. So in MATLAB, there is a function called R locus, which does the root locus plot for you. And for that, all you need to do, it, it will do the simplification to get the characteristic equation. All you need to give is the so-called open loop transfer function. Okay, this is why I introduced this idea, the terminology of open loop transfer function. It's nothing but the product of all the transfer functions. Okay. So in MATLAB, we need to define the numerator and denominator. Okay, so it is, remember, 1 plus g equal to 0. But g is equal to, that is the open loop transfer function, g1, g2 times h. Okay, in this particular case. And h is kc. So it is kc divided by tau 1s plus 1 tau 2 s plus 1, tau 3 s plus 1. You need to give only g to the MATLAB root locus function as a transfer function in C. Something that we saw earlier, if you have moved in a while, you might have forgotten that. Okay? So the function to do that is Tf. Tf creates a transfer function, but you need to give the numerator and denominator of g. And when you do that, you, you do it in such a way that you don't specify Kc in there. MATLAB or locus will change the Kc values. Okay? So all you need to do is go back to the open loop transfer function. Let me show you. Yeah. This is the open loop transfer function that you see here. Okay, so you define it without the k in it, assuming k to be one, and it will change the values of k for you. So when you do the transfer function, you, need, you don't have to specify k, and it doesn't do it symbolically; it does it numerically by changing various values of k. Okay. So in this particular case, the numerator is one, and the denominator is this uh, cubic polynomial. So I'm going to have uh, in MATLAB. The numerator is one. Okay. Denominator is, uh, can somebody repeat those numbers for me? One, six, eleven, and one is it? Six. Six? Okay. Uh, plus six, and then I'm defining the transfer function. So it takes the numerator and denominator polynomials and defines the open loop transfer function with k normalized to 1. And then pass this to the root locus. And this is really magic because it does all the calculations and gives you the final graph. This is why I love math. There it is. So this is a much clearer picture in three different colors. And you will notice that the starting point is marked showing you. When k is zero, these are the rows that we have minus one point. And what happens is the red color, 
one of the roads has to change this way, one of the roads moves this way and moves back. The other road moves this way and moves down. And the third road moves this way. These are the paths of three such roads. Now, if I give you, if I give you as a fourth out of polynomial, how many such curves will there be? Four such curves. Okay? Because it simply plots how many number of roads that you have, it plots the variation of those roads as you change case. Now, this by itself will be good, but MATLAB can also give you, if you click on that, what is the gain? This is the k value. In this case, at that particular point, what is the value of k? Where is the four? And uh, what are the frequencies and stuff like that? Okay. 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 So if I click here, for example, it gives you 60.9. I could click right on the border, but this is a very important result because by clicking on the position where it just crosses, I get roughly an idea. The k is somewhere around 60. Okay. So that is essentially the idea behind the root locus. And what we want is this particular point. The point where it crosses the right axis according to the point. Yeah. Do you have a question? No. No. Okay. Okay. Yeah. This is not significant in the sense that this is not going to give you any trouble. This particular branch is not always a stable mode. Each eigenvalue you call as a stable or an unstable mode. So there are three eigenvalues in a particular case. One eigenvalue behaves well, no matter what the real case is that you show at it. The other two eigenvalues merge. So you can get a lot of information. As long as your k value is between this and this, you have a monotonic decay. So there's no oscillation possible. Okay? So you get that information. And this eigenvalue, if I ask to, if I ask you the question, uh, there are three solutions, e to the power eigenvalue 1 times t plus e to the power eigenvalue 2 times t, etc. Which one will decay most? Which one will give you the least trouble in terms of the disturbance rejection? The answer would be this eigenvalue because it will have a large amount of Larger amplitude means e to the power minus of negative number, large number t, so to zero by frequency. And then this one will practice longer. The closer you are to the vertical axis, the longer it's going to take. So that that value of k is not as desirable. You would ideally like the k value to be uh, where one where the response is very quick. But the k value affects all three roots. Okay? So if you click, for example, here, you get a k value of 8.9. Okay, there will be a corresponding root here for 8.9. Okay, because for 8.9 there are three roots. For any value of k there are three roots. Okay, but this branch is not being giving problem. The other two branches eventually give you a problem when k exceeds 50. But even if you are close to it, it can give you oscillations. It can give you overshoot. All this information is given. To you. So in that sense, the root locus, this particular graph, gives you more information than what the graph that we can generate will give. Yes, that's what we need to do next. How do I generalize this to CID controller? It's possible to do it for CID controller also. But you need to choose one parameter, either k or tau i or tau d. You can value only one parameter. Others have to be fixed. Because this graph is fixing two of the three parameters in the PID controller. We can generate such a graph. We can do that. But like they have nobody has done that. You can write the toolbox for that and map in the 3D parameter space what is the range of tau i, what is the range of tau d. And what is the range of KC where you have a stable regime? It's possible to do in principle. Yeah. Okay, so it's a very powerful tool from that point of view in, in mapping the stability boundaries and saying something about the dynamics. Okay, so we will see a few more problems uh, using the root locus. And in the last 
assignment that I'm going to give you, I will have a few problems on root locus as well as on uh, the next, the last method which is a quick into the sum method. Okay, this is okay.